I'm an engineer, uh, I'm a planner. I worked for many years with cities uh, doing engineering work and planning work. And I, I found uh, that I was, I was one of those people who kept asking questions all the time and never got very satisfying answers. Uh, there was a, a meeting, I was chatting with someone outside before I came in. Uh, I remember a meeting as a, as a young engineer uh, where I asked a question and I was told, well, come on, Chuck, that's the way things have always been done. Uh, just, you know, stop asking so many questions. Uh, back in 2008, uh, I had worked with cities for a, a very long time and, and, and tried to help them uh, look at the financial aspects of their growth and development pattern. And we were in an area where things were growing really robustly. Uh, this was the run up to the, the housing bubble bursting and everything was just growth, growth, growth where I lived. Despite the fact that everything was going gangbusters, uh, we didn't seem to have any money to do anything. We had huge backlogs of maintenance that needed to be done. Uh, we were having emergency meetings to uh, close the library early to save a few dollars, to shut off the street lights overnight so that we didn't have to pay for that. We were laying off police officers and firefighters, and these were in the good times. Uh, in 2008, we had this crazy election cycle, which at the time seemed insane. Now it seems rather quaint. Uh, but, but back then, it felt really nutty. And I, I remember at the end of that going, there, there's nobody here talking about why our cities are struggling. There's nobody here talking about why uh, we can't just do basic, basic things. But I realized that I, I, I didn't understand it fully myself. And so I sat down, and I said, I'm going to write three days a week. And in November of 08, I started uh, the Strong Towns blog. Uh, that has grown now into an international movement of people working to make their cities stronger and more resilient and change our conversation about how we build places. Uh, the mission of our nonprofit organization is to support a model of growth that allows our cities, towns, and neighborhoods to become financially strong and resilient. What I'd like to do today is answer that question, why are our cities struggling despite having all this growth, despite all the job programs, despite all the incentives? And then what can we start to do differently uh, so that our places become strong and resilient? I want to start the conversation with a backdrop understanding of the way cities were built. These are two ancient cities. The one on the left is ancient Ur, Fertile Crescent, like 4000 BC. The one on the right, of course, is ancient Rome. When we look at these cities, uh, we understand that they were built around the dominant transportation technology of the day, that, of course, being your two feet. People walked everywhere they went. And so the spacing, the scale, the distance between different types of things people would do on a normal day, all of this was based around a society of people who walked. We can fast forward thousands of years. This is my hometown. I live in Brainerd, Minnesota. It's a couple hours north of Minneapolis, St. Paul. This is what it looked like back in 1904. People would arrive by train. They would arrive by stagecoach. But once they got there, they would walk everywhere they went. And so the spacing, the scale, the distances between different types of things people would do on a normal day, all this was very similar to what we had seen in cities for thousands and thousands of years. Beginning in the early 1900s and then accelerating after World War II, we began to build cities around a different transportation technology, right? We began to build cities around the automobile. Uh, we came up with different building types, different building styles, different ways of arranging things on the landscape. If we were to go out today and, and pull 20 people off the street and, and randomly ask them uh, to explain this transition, they would likely talk about it in terms of progress. We used to be a society of people who walked everywhere, so we built cities around people who walked. Now we're a society of people who drive, so we build cities around people who drive. Someday we will have jet cars, and we'll build cities around people who use jet cars, and someday we will teleport, and our cities will look completely different than they do today. This is a very affirming way to look at things. It's a, it's a very comforting approach, because it puts us on this continuum of things continually getting better. I want to put a different idea in the back of your mind here uh, as a way to think about this transition. When we look at these two societies here, uh, when we even look at just ancient Ur, we have to understand that by the time you get to ancient Ur, humans had been experimenting with how to build cities 
for thousands and thousands of years. They tried things. What worked, they would keep and expand upon. What didn't work, people died. Those cities went away, right? Those ideas weren't transmitted to the next generation. By the time you get to ancient Rome, you have an approach to building and developing cities that have been honed over thousands of years by trial and error experimentation. And by the time you get to my hometown in the early 1900s, you see a, a, a basic style and approach to growth and development around the world that is universal. Different latitudes, different continents, different cultures. We have different architectural styles, different building materials, but the basic essence of the layout and design of our places is essentially universal. When we look at this style of growth and development, there's no thousands of years of trial and error, right? We didn't, we didn't try this out. You, you guys didn't let us in the States experiment this for a couple hundred years and then you know, see what the crazy Americans did and then take the best ideas north, right? We didn't uh, you know, try these things out. What, what did we do? We took the best ideas at the time, which largely came from you know, university, universities and, and European intellectuals. We brought their ideas here and we did them at scale across an entire continent all within a generation. It's important for us to understand that we are living in one of the greatest experiments that's ever been tried. Not only uh, an experiment in terms of our geography, but an experiment in terms of our economy, our society, our culture, based on a new living arrangement, a new way of relating to each other, a new way of occupying the landscape that is very, very young and has never been tried before. What we're going to talk about today are some of the financial implications of this, things that weren't apparent to people back when they started this. Early on at Strong Towns, one of the things that, that we did was to uh, kind of attack the notion that we've come to call the quantum theory of economic development. The quantum theory of economic development goes something like this. Um, we know that this project by itself doesn't make much financial sense. We know that this project by itself doesn't make much financial sense. And we know that this project looked at by itself doesn't make fi much financial sense. But when you combine them all together, they become this greater whole. And I ran into this theory in practice many, many times when I would be in planning meetings for projects. And I would say, like, why are we doing this? This doesn't make any sense. And they'd say, well, Chuck, it's part of a bigger system. This is one component. You can't evaluate this just on its own. You've got to look at the larger system. So with that understanding, uh, we went out and looked at parts of our system that, from a very strict accounting standpoint, should be profitable. There's no kind of weird things going on. Uh, the, the stuff like this here. This is a, a dead-end cul-de-sac. It's a simple road. There's no through traffic. There's no commercial traffic. This was built in the mid-1990s. When this was built, the city uh, agreed to pay half the cost if the property owners pay the other half. So what we said is, all right, based on the revenue the city's collecting from the property owners that live here, the only people that use this road in any significant way, how long is it going to take them to recoup the money they just spent to build that? The answer is 37 years. And that's 37 years for half the money. The road's not going to last that long. When the road falls apart, the city's going to have to come up with the money to fix it. Where's that going to come from? Not from these property owners here. Here's another uh, development. This is a kind of standard suburban fair uh, closed loop system with a dead end cul-de-sac. This was built in the early 1980s. The developer actually paid for all the costs to build this development. Uh, those costs were rolled over into the sale of the homes. So people have been paying those costs on their mortgages. It's included in their property value in a sense. They've also been paying taxes to the city under the idea that when this stuff fell apart, the city would go out and fix it and maintain it. Uh, there's no through traffic. There's no commercial traffic. The only reason this road exists is to serve these particular homes. Uh, the city had to go out and fix this road. The cost to do that was $354,000. We asked the question, uh, how, based on the taxes the city collects from the people that live within this development, how long is it going to take them to recoup the money they just spent to fix that road? The answer is 79 years. Now, we all know the road won't last 79 years. So we said, okay, 
Let's say between now and the time the road fell apart, the city wanted to collect enough taxes from these property owners to actually go out and fix and maintain their road. What would that mean? It would mean an immediate 46% increase in taxes with annual increases of 3% over inflation every year for the next 25 years with all that money going just to maintain the roadway. The sewer, the water, the storm sewer, vastly more expensive undertakings. Now sometimes people say to me, okay Chuck, uh, we get it, we know we lose money on residential property, we make it up on commercial, commercial is our cash cow. Uh, my response to that is, I don't know any corporation that loses money on 90% of what it does and tries to make it up on the last 10%. I don't know why an incorporated municipality would think that was a good business strategy. Nonetheless, we've kind of convinced ourselves in a way that if we just have enough commercial property, we're good to go. This is a business park. This is one of those build it and they will come kind of investments that cities like to do. This was built in the mid 1990s. Every single lot in this park is now occupied. The city felt this was such a successful project, they wanted to build the same exact thing on property they own right next door. So just take this and mirror it and build the same thing. We said, okay, if we could build the same thing for the same amount of money and get the same amount of investment, would this be a good deal for the city? There's six point, uh, in today's dollars, it would cost 2.1 million to build. There's 6.6 .6 million of, of value that's been created in that park. Now, pause for a second. Of that 6.6 .6 million, four of those lots are a church. Two of the lots belong to the school district. It's a bus maintenance facility. One of the lots is a county maintenance garage. One of the lots is a city maintenance garage. These are all very important public facilities, but none of them pay any taxes to the city. Of the remaining properties, every single one was given a long-term tax subsidy in order to attract them to move into that park. For the sake of our analysis, it was the only way we could make the numbers work, uh, we had to assume that within one year of this new park being built, every single lot would be occupied by a non-subsidized full tax paying entity and that every dollar of new revenue would go to retiring that bond. If that were the case, it would still take the city almost three decades, 29 years, just to break even. That's 29 years where everybody else's taxes would have to go up to plow the snow, mow the ditches, provide police and fire protection, and all the other services that are needed. And that's in the most wildly optimistic scenario. Let me show you what's going on. And in the early days of giving this talk, I was so proud of the work we had done. I, I went through like 15 different case studies and people would just start crying at some point and it, it didn't. <laughs> I found I can make the point in just three. If you're interested in more, I'll give you our website at the end and there's a bunch of these case studies on there. But I think it's evident what is going on here. Let me break it down for you like this. This is a, a cash flow diagram. Let's say that developer comes to us and says, I, I have a piece of property here I would like to build upon. Uh, I'm not asking for any subsidies. I'm willing to meet all of your rules and regulations. I will, at my expense, go out and build all the residential homes, all the commercial buildings. I will install to your standards, at my expense, all the roads and the streets and the curb and the sidewalks, the pipes and the pumps and the valves and the meters, I'll pay for all that. The only thing that I'm asking as a developer is that when I finish making this investment in your community, that you, the, the city, the taxpayer, the public, agree to take over the long-term responsibility of servicing and maintaining all this stuff. W what would we say? We'd say, fantastic, right? You mean we spend nothing? You put in everything? We get all this new tax base and all this new growth, and, and, and all we got to do is, is go out and maintain it? Some, this, is, this is ideal, right? But let's say you know, we're smart, prudent people, We've heard of this strong town stuff. We want to make sure we, we're doing the right thing. So when the money comes in from this new development, uh, what we do is we take the portion that would normally get siphoned off and spent in other parts of the city fixing and maintaining stuff, and we, we just set that aside. And every year when that money comes in, we take that portion, we set it aside, and we allow it to accumulate 
so that when we get out decades into the future and we have to make good on this promise we made that we would fix and maintain all this stuff, we've got a pot of money there to do it. This is what that looks like. In year one, everything is brand new. New tax revenue comes in, you take that portion, you set it aside. Year two, more money comes in, you add to what you had in year one. Year three, a little bit more, year four, year five, and you can see a five-year-old road isn't costing you anything. A 10-year-old sidewalk isn't costing you anything. A 15-year-old pipe isn't costing you anything. So you get a couple of decades out, and you just had all this money coming in, you've got a, a big pile of cash sitting there. You're feeling pretty rich. The problem is, when you have to go out, in this example, in year 25, and make good on that promise you made a generation ago, what you find is that the cumulative amount of money is insufficient. And from a cash flow standpoint, even though you felt very rich for 24 years, all of a sudden, you run far, far into the negative. Now, cities aren't one development, right? Cities are a, 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 a series of developments, a collection of neighborhoods. So let's say that our developer comes back in a, a couple years later and says, you know, that worked really well for you, it worked really well for me. I'd like to do a similar size development. And every other year from this point forward, a developer walks in the door with, with a proposal for a similar size development. In other words, the ideal scenario for any city. Nice, steady, continuous growth. And we take that money and we set it aside and we save it for the day when we have to make good on all these promises that we're making as we grow and develop. Here's what that looks like. In year one, everything's brand new in the first development. It pays in the entire 25 years shown here. In year three, you add a second development, it starts to pay in. Year five, another, year seven, and on and on and on. And you can see, not only do you not have any expenses going out, everything's brand new, it's not costing you anything, but you're having growth upon growth upon growth. Your cash actually starts to accelerate upwards. You're feeling very, very rich. And yes, when you get to year 25, you have to make good on that very first promise you made way back in year one. You've got to spend a little bit of money, right? But it's not a big deal. You've had all this growth. The growth creates what we call the illusion of wealth. Because as we all intuitively understand, if you lose money on every transaction, you don't make it up in volume. If you lose money over the long term on every project that you do, the further you go out in time, the more downward pressure there is on your budget. This is the answer to that question. Why are cities struggling? Why can we have so much growth, so much investment, so much you know, success, yet struggle to do basic, basic things? Why can we find millions of dollars to do big projects to try to create new growth, but we can't find a few thousand to, to paint a crosswalk, or keep the library open, or keep the streetlights on? This is why. Because we're living way out here on the far edge of this. You, you, you may be aware of this, uh, I'm not gonna presume, uh, but we had an election last year. Um, it was kind of a crazy thing. I see my fellow American shaking her head. We, we had an election. Um, it was a very, uh, you know, contentious affair. Um, we had two 70-year-olds uh, explaining essentially the best time in their life's history and how they were going to recreate that today. They were, in a sense, and I'm going to see if I can do this with a point, they were, in a sense, explaining what life was like right here and how they were going to make today much like life was like back then. But we don't live there anymore, right? We, we live way, way, way out here. In this election, you heard things about how Government was, you know, inefficient. You heard things about how corporations were greedy. You heard things about how uh, public employees were lazy. You heard things about those people. Wh whatever your narrative was, uh, there was a narrative applied to essentially this existential crisis here. I'm going to deconstruct that for just a second. And I'm going to ask you a couple questions. First, do you recognize yourself in this chart here? Do, do, do you see your own behavior? This is why people smoke, right? This is why you'll go home and instead of going for a walk, 
uh, you'll sit in front of the TV and have a bowl of ice cream, right? Oh, this ice cream is good. I like this TV show. Uh-oh, heart disease, right? <laughs> As human beings, we are wired to highly value positive feedback today and to deeply discount negative feedback in the future. This is a human flaw that we all share. You can apply a left of center narrative to it, you can apply a right of center narrative to it, but this is a human problem. This is a human failing that we all have. What happened to the civilizations thousands of years ago that based their economy and their development model around exploitation of this human failure. What happened to them? Th they went away, right? Their, their ideas failed. Their ideas were not transmitted to the next generation as something resilient that would work. Obviously, there's some huge implications to all this. The way we become used to growing is on the wane. Our state and federal governments, here in Canada, in the United States, are vastly overburdened. They don't have the money to come and bail out every city that needs trouble, every city that has huge backlog of maintenance things to do. What this means for us is that we're gonna be forced to absorb our own costs of our own development pattern. If we want that road fixed, we have to pay for it. If we want that pipe repaired, that money has to come from us. This can't be done in the current pattern of development without some incredibly large tax increases and or some devastatingly large cuts in services. Now, I wasn't invited here to tell you what you already know, right? Isn't this the, the debate we're having at every level of government everywhere? How big is the tax increase gonna be? Who should pay for that? How deep is the service cut gonna be? And where is that going to be felt? It's critical sitting here today that we see the third variable in the sentence, the third variable being the current pattern of development. As long as we continue to build in an approach that is functionally insolvent, there's no way our cities will avoid insolvency. As long as we continue to build in an approach that gives us an illusion of wealth today in exchange for enormous long-term liabilities, there's no way that our cities will avoid default. We have to start having a conversation about how we build places that are financially more productive. So how do we do this? Early on uh, in Strong Towns, I was, I was invited to do uh, a couple talks in California, and I wound up doing a, a tour of the entire state. My friend here from Southern California, you'll appreciate this. Um, as I went around and shared this message with people, we're gonna talk the rest of the time here now about how we think differently and how we approach things differently. Uh, yet, I would get to the end of my presentation, and one of these Californians would always stand up and say, Chuck, I'm so angry with you. You've come here and scared us, but you didn't give us the solution. What is the solution to these problems? And it, it took me a while to realize what was being asked, because what was being asked was different than the words I was hearing. What was being asked was this, what can someone else change about what they're doing so that I don't have to change anything about what I'm doing? We've tried all of those solutions, right? We, we, we've tried that. We, we call that kicking the can down the road often. We are, in many ways, running out of road. The liabilities are adding up. And our ability to uh, you know, not impact people's lives uh, is ending. Uh, at Strong Towns, we don't talk about these this as a problem, because problems have solutions. What we talk about this as a predicament, because predicaments have outcomes. And what we're really at a phase now is managing outcomes. And when we talk about managing outcomes, at Strong Towns, uh, we have a term we call rational responses. How do we, as thoughtful, intelligent, rational people, working together in a community, look at this complex set of problems that we face and respond as thoughtful human beings. And when we go to rational responses, I always start with this photo here. Again, this is my hometown back in the early 1900s. And when I first saw this photo, I was, I was blown away. I, I was blown away because there's nothing like this today. Uh, the planner in me, you know, looked at the way the buildings line up just perfectly, the way they frame the public realm at just the right Greco-Roman ratios. There's great segmentation of the space. The buildings themselves front the street perfectly. They've got great symmetry. This is an exquisitely designed street. Let me ask you some questions about these people here. 
How thick was their zoning code? How many boards and committees did they have to go to to get an approval to build something? How much tax subsidy did they get? How many grants did they uh, receive? How many engineers and planners and economic development advisors did they have on staff? How many miles of road and pipe did they put in the ground to attract development? We can go through the litany of things that we think today are absolutely essential to creating great cities. They had none of them. Yet look at what they built. These were a bunch of illiterate lumberjacks in the middle of nowhere. Look at the place they built. How did they do this? It's really simple. They just copied what they knew worked. They took a pattern and an approach that they had seen work for thousands and thousands of years. They took the materials they had on hand and they just copied that. They just built what they knew worked. After 70 plus years of all the advice from planners and engineers and economic development people on how to create growth and jobs and eternal prosperity, after all the tax subsidies and growth initiatives, after all the things we've done to make our places more prosperous, here's what this exact same street looks like today. It's a wasteland of parking lots and half-occupied buildings. And if you want to grasp in one snapshot why our cities are struggling financially, there's a half million dollars of public infrastructure in that street right there. Where, where's the wealth that's going to sustain that generation after generation after generation? I was in uh, a university <coughs> in Boise, Idaho, giving a lecture. And I got to this image here, and a student stood up, raised their hand, said, Chuck, uh, I'm from Costa Rica. Costa Rica is a very poor country. We can't afford to build the way that you build here. When we build in Costa Rica, we have to build one block at a time. And we have to make sure that every gap is filled in in the block we just built. Otherwise, we won't be able to afford it. We're a very poor country. We can't afford to build this way. We're very poor countries now too, right? We can't afford to build this way either. And for a long period of time, that illusion of wealth made us think that this kind of thing didn't matter. That we could have huge gaps in, in our landscape. Uh, where we had millions of dollars in the ground, that we could run pipe all over the place, that we could put in miles of roads and interchanges, and we could have all kinds of area devoted just to temporarily storing cars, and, and none of it mattered because we were so rich. It matters. And the difference between cities that are going to be successful in the next generation and the ones that are going to struggle are the places that are going to start obsessing over these kind of details. So how do we start to think differently? Build it and they will come is a fantastic movie plot. It is a horrible economic development strategy. We are in what we at Strong Towns call the desperation phase of this suburban experiment. Uh, if you are a city today and you want to be a player in the game, what do you have to do? Well, you've got to have shovel-ready sites. You've got to have millions of dollars of stuff in the ground waiting for you know, Google or whoever to come through town. You gotta have a team of people standing by ready to hand out subsidies. This is not how cities build wealth. And this is not how cities have ever built wealth. I'm going to show you right now the very simple way that cities build wealth. Do any of you know what city this is? It could be Calgary, right? At one point in Calgary's history, it looked just like this. Trees aren't that different, right? Going uh, west, it, it could be Vancouver. Vancouver certainly started like this, right? If we go east, this easily could be Winnipeg, could be Thunder Bay, could be Toronto, could be Montreal. They, they all started just like this, right? Uh, every city that was ever founded prior to our modern suburban experiment began just like this. Manhattan began just like this, a few pop-up shacks, some hopes and some dreams about the future. Chicago, San Francisco, Dallas, London, Paris, Rome. This could be, you know, Romulus and Remus standing here, right? Rome, Rome began just like this. We built thousands of cities just like this across this continent. And for a variety of complex reasons, reasons that defy our ability to predict or project or even to fully understand after the fact, a lot of these places failed. 
What happens when a place like this fails? Does the stock market crash? Do we have to have emergency sessions uh, you know, uh, of Congress to bail out banks? Do, does unemployment skyrocket? Does the economy crash? No, what happens? These are little bets. A few people lose a little bit of money, they salvage what they can, they move on to the next place. We built thousands of these across this continent and for a variety of complex reasons, reasons that defy our ability to predict or project or even to fully understand after the fact, a lot of these places were successful. And when they were successful, they would grow in a very simple way. They would grow incrementally up, incrementally out, and become incrementally more intense. And so after 30 years of incremental growth, this street, which is my hometown in 1870, would become the street I showed you earlier. And after another 40 years of incrementally growing up, incrementally growing out, and incrementally becoming more intense, these two and three story wood structures would be transformed into buildings of brick and granite. We don't build wealth by going to the casino and putting it all on red. The way cities build wealth is by making small investments over a broad area over a long period of time. Let me show you how powerful this incremental approach to building is. These are two identical blocks in my hometown. The one on the left I've labeled old and blighted, the one on the right I've labeled shiny and new. If you look at them, you'll see that the same area, the same amount of public infrastructure, they are on the same thoroughfare, the same neighborhood. Everything about them is the same except for the style of development. That old and blighted block uh, looks like this. Back in the 1920s, as my city was growing incrementally, the next increment of out were these three blocks. So what you are looking at here is the 1920s far edge of town, their version of the little pop-up shacks. This was essentially the cheapest commercial building you were gonna build at the time. And, and had things progressed as they had for thousands of years, what would have happened? You would have eventually gotten second, third stories, they would have become more intense, more ornate. But that's not what happened. After these were built in the 1920s, we had the Depression, we had World War II, and then we had a completely different style of development that skipped right over this and started building out on the edge. This block has stagnated for 90 years. Two blocks over used to look just like this. We had it labeled blight and had it torn down, and now we have the new Taco John's drive through This meets all the setbacks, meets all the parking requirements, meets the sign ordinance, the floor area ratio, Everybody was thrilled about this, right? We got rid of blight. We've got a little bit of green space now. They actually built a sidewalk here. The sidewalk ends right there, but they built that stretch. Here's what nobody bothered to consider. That old and blighted block has a total value of $1.1 million. That shiny and new block, when it was built, same size area, same amount of public infrastructure, just a different style of growth and development had a total value of only $800,000. There's 42% more wealth in that old rundown junkie block. The city's actually collecting 42% more property taxes from that old rundown blighted block. Understand what you're looking at. You're looking at the incremental pattern of development, the way people around the world built for thousands and thousands of years. You're looking at it in its infant phase. After 90 years of neglect, and it still outperforms by a wide margin the stuff we're building brand new today. And we all know the trajectory of the taco joint, right? You guys have, we, we, we had a, we've got a cultural uh, invasion going on right now. I was actually protesting the, the cultural imperialism uh, because we have Tim Hortons now opened up <laughs> in, uh, in my hometown. Yeah. Um, just, you know, you, you have to export your culture to every place, don't you? Um, so, uh, but you, you guys have, you, you understand what happens, right? 20 years later, this will be a used car lot. 10 years later, it will be boarded up and we'll be trying to get some type of grant to get it torn down and redeveloped. We've all been around long enough to see this happen. In fact, in the few years since this was built, here's what's happened to the property values. This is the same kind of thing we see on the edge of our cities. 